Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Virtual Counterculture with Mahon Menorca Cheese. I'm Susan Axelrod, Editor of Culture, and I'm especially excited about this webinar this afternoon because this is a Spanish cheese that I'm not as familiar with. I hope you all have brought your samples to room temperature. I've got mine right here, ready to go. Can you see it? There we are. Um, I have sneaked a little bite and I love the texture of it and the flavor and I'm really excited to learn more. And before we get started, let me just, most of you have done this before, but if you haven't, just a couple of housekeeping details. Uh, use the chat feature or the Q&A to ask your questions. We will answer some questions during the presentation, but we will also have a dedicated Q&A time at the end, about 10 minutes to answer some more questions. And we love your feedback, we love your observations and your questions, so keep them coming. So today, first we're going to hear from Jeffrey Shaw, who's the marketing director for Foods of Spain. And then we are going to hear from Eva Pareo, who is with the Mahon Menorca Consorcio in, um, in Spain. She's coming to us live from España. And then we have Emilia Dalbero from the Green Grape in Brooklyn, who is going to really take a deep dive into this cheese and talk about how to merchandise it, how to serve it, how to pair it, and all those good things. So I'm not going to take up any more of your time. Uh, don't forget to use the chat feature. And Jeffrey, take it away. Thank you, Susan. On behalf of Foods and Wines in Spain, which is who I represent, Thank you for joining us today, and a special thank you to you, Susan, Culture Magazine, for organizing today's session, and, of course, what's magnificent and very much needed, the PDO Maon Menorca. Spain has a rich, centuries-old cheese-making tradition from goat, sheep, and cow's milk, which happens to be today's cheeses. Today, we have well over 100 cheeses, of which 32 have the recognized by law designation of origin status, which affirms they are special, their individuality, their origin, their quality. Today, we will learn about one of these gastronomic gems, the PDO, which stands for Protected Designation of Origin, Maun Menorca Cheese. With us, our cheese guide, Emilia from Green Grape Provisions. But before we get started, I am pleased to present Eva Perello from PDO Mount Menorca. Over to you, Eva. Okay, thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you, everyone, for organizing this event, and thank you for watching and for being interested in in our cheese. So, I'm going to I'm going to introduce you a little bit about the PDO and also the the function of the um, of the of our council. Okay, so I'm going to, can you pass the slide, please? Two slides, okay. So first of all, I'm going to, to introduce you a little bit uh, what is the PDO, okay? The PDO, it is a geographical name of a region or locality used to designate a product, which has differentiated qualities due to the natural environment of production area and the production process. You can identify it in the market with these two seals uh, you see in, uh, in the screen. Okay, so now, great. Now I'm going to, um, to place uh, Menorca in the map. Okay, Menorca is a uh, Spanish island placed in the Mediterranean Sea it belong, and belongs to the Balearic Islands. Okay, this, this is our production area. So next one, please. So what the PDO protect? We protect uh, that uh, we produce only the island of Menorca, we already see. We also protect the milk characteristics and the breeds of the cows. We also uh, protect that we produce only by using the traditional method. And also the physical and chemical specification to result as a cheese with a differential sensory characteristics. Next, please. Okay, so the main functions of the council. So we make three, three big functions. So one is managing the quality. So we control the quality systems of the PDO. 
We also made some audits and inspection at, the, at each farm and each uh, company belongs to the PDO. And also do, we do physical and chemical and sensory ana analysis. And uh, our second function uh, we do is uh, we represent and promote the PDO Mao Menorca by doing some information talks, tasting and pairings, and also some gastronomic events. Also, we, we participate in trade shows and uh, we organize on point of sale tasting and also some online and offline media participation. And, and the third point is that we defend uh, the PDO against the bad use of the name. Next, please. So the, some current information about the PDO uh, just for your information, is that now we have registered 104 farms, uh, 1,905 cows, also uh, 47 factories and 37 trade companies. In total, we are involved in this project uh, more than uh, one, 100 people. Hold on. Next, please. Okay, so uh, now I want to also to to explain you some production and commercialization of uh, Mao Menorca cheese, some information that maybe it could be of your interest. So the milk production for, for our registered farm is more than uh, 41 million liters. And the meal destinated for the production of our products, of our cheese, is more than 20 million liters that it's done that uh, the total cheese we produce is nearly 3 million kilos per year. Okay, so the total, the total cheese sold is also near, nearly 2.4 uh, million kilos per year. And the value of the sold product, it's around uh, 50 million euros. Okay, next, please. Okay, finally, I just want to, to, to explain to you that uh, the value of our product and the differentiation of our product in the market is, is that we guarantee the, the origin of the cheese. We also uh, assure the quality. And uh, also we, it, this is a cheese that is the tradition and the sustainability of the Menorquin uh, countryside. And, uh, and of course, we preserve the flavor, the aroma, and the characteristics of this ancestral cheese. And this is my final slide. And I just want to thank you, everyone, for watching. And thank you for the organization. Thank you. I believe it's time to turn it over to Amelia. There you are. Hello. Hi. Thank you, Susan. Um, I am Amelia. Um, I am the cheese department manager and um, buyer at the Green Grape in Brooklyn, New York. I don't know if anyone has ever been there or heard, heard of us, but we are an independent and woman-owned specialty grocery store right in the heart of Fort Greene. We've been there for about 15 years. Um, and what I do is that um, I do all of the research to bring in high quality and artisan products and sell them to our customers. Um, so my, my job is very research based, which um, means I was very excited to be asked to do um, this webinar because I love doing research and huge cheese nerd. Um, and I'm really excited to talk to you today about Mahon Menorca. Um, I have been cheesemongering for about five years now. Um, I am an ACS certified cheese professional and also a cheesemonger invitationalist, the invitational finalist and winner. Um, so I really, really love talking about cheese. So um, right away, let's, uh, let's just get into it. Um, we have a PowerPoint presentation for you. Awesome. So Mahon Menorca PDO is actually Spain's second most popular cheese. A lot of our customers actually ask for it by name, which is very cool because um, we were talking about this before the, the class started, but in some of the larger grocery stores, it can be hard to find this cheese, but more and more now you see it very present in, um, in specialty shops, which is awesome because it is a really, really amazing cheese. It's a cow's milk cheese from the island of Menorca, as Ava told us, um, and Menorca is 
is the outermost of the Spanish Balearic Islands. It's only about 300 square miles, so it doesn't have a lot of tourist activity because it's mostly used for agriculture like cheese making. So Mahone is the capital city of the island and of course the name of the cheese. It has a typical Mediterranean climate, dry, warm summers, mild, rainy winters, um, and it's actually a um, UNESCO Biosphere Reserve site, which is very cool. So knowing the island of Menorca is important because the terroir of the island is what makes this cheese really unique. And we talk about terroir in cheese just like we talk about it in wine. So it's the flavor of the place, how all of the aspects of the environment work together to create the flavor of the cheese. Every aspect like animals diet, the weather, temperature, humidity, ambient bacteria in the aging caves, every little thing can affect the flavor of this cheese. And because of this, you could try to make Mahone the same exact way anywhere else in the world and it, it just wouldn't taste the same. So the history of this cheese is actually very extensive. It dates back to the 15th century and there's written records of cheese making on the island of Menorca from the year 417. And then they also found ceramic remains of utensils that are used to make cheese that date back to 2000 BC. So they've been making cheese here for a very, very long time. The recipe for Mahon Menorca PDO has been passed down through generations of family cheesemakers to create the piece of cheese that you have sitting in front of you today. And I have a little piece there. I made sure to keep the rind on. That's gonna be important later. The island does have a long history of being invaded over the years. And most notably, um, it was invaded by the British in the 18th century. And they actually introduced the breed of cows that today produce most of the milk for Mahon Menorca, um, which is Holstein. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So in the late 1800s, there were locals that were called, um, I'm so sorry for my Spanish pronunciation. Um, I speak a little bit of Italian, but my Spanish is not so good. So recogedor afinador, and that means gatherer ripeners. And they popularized the cheese and aged them in underground caves where the temperature and humidity and ambient air provided the cheese with that unique microclimate that produces its traditional flavor. So today there are more than 100 farms and about 6,000 cows across the island, as Eva mentioned, that produce what we call green or unaged cheese that is sold to the affineurs or the larger cooperatives that age it and then sell it. And so the Mahone website lists about 30 companies that sell this cheese. Ava gave the exact numbers. And there are different brands of Mahone Menorca available in the United States, but they do all have that same great taste because of the cheese's PDO status that we discussed a little bit earlier. It was granted the PDO status finally in 1996, and that label, the Mahone Menorca label, as well as that PDO seal is visible on the packaging of the cheese that you received. And you can also see it on the slide there. Um, as we heard from Eva, PDO is the European designation that means protected designation of origin. And that signifies that the production and sale and promotion of this cheese is highly regulated by a consortium, which guarantees the quality and authenticity of the cheese. And putting that PDO seal on the final product helps consumers recognize that the cheese that they're buying is the real deal. Producers who don't adhere to the rules and standards set by the Regulatory Council are not legally allowed to call their cheese Mahone Menorca PDO. So when you sell a PDO cheese to your customers, you, you're guaranteeing them that quality product. So it's really important to be aware of, of what that symbol actually means. Um, okay, so we can go to the next slide. Great. So there are two versions of Mahone Menorca PDO. We have Mahone Menorca, and we also have Mahone Menorca Artisano. Mahone Menorca, which is more readily available in the United States, is made with milk that has been heat treated in some way, and then the cheese is actually shaped using molds. Mahone Artisano is, Mahone Menorca Artisano is much more difficult to find in the United States. I have seen it a couple of times, which is great. Um, but it is only made with raw milk and shaped the traditional way with cheesecloth, and we'll talk more about that in a bit. So today we're tasting a pasteurized version of Mahone Menorca, and um, so let's talk about how it is made. Sorry, I'm having a little bit of a technical difficulty with my notes here. Um, great, okay, okay, we're in the right place. 
so as part of the PDO guidelines, the cheese can be raw or pasteurized, um, but depending on the type of Mahon Menorca that we are making. And today, most of that milk comes from the breed Holstein Frisian cows. And those are the most popular cow breed in the entire United States, in the entire world really, because they do produce the most milk and it is high, high quality milk. So they're, they're really, um, they're really the best cows for cheese making. And these are the animals that you think of when you hear the word cow. It's the traditional black and white cows that everyone's familiar with. And I, the, I have a picture on the slide there in case anyone's not familiar with those cows. So these lovely cows are milked twice a day, once in the morning and once at night. And the whole milk, which is not skimmed milk, the whole milk is added to the vat for cheese making. And they do use traditional animal rennet to coagulate the milk for this cheese. And for those of you who don't know, rennet is an enzyme traditionally taken from the stomach of a baby animal and they use it to coagulate the milk and separate it into curds and whey. So once the curds have formed in the vat, um, they leave them for about 30 to 40 minutes and then they cut the curds down to about the size of a pea. The smaller, basically the smaller you cut a curd, the more whey and moisture is taken out of there and that helps you to get the texture and the um, kind of the, the, the moisture content of the cheese that you're looking for. So they cut those curds to about the size of a pea and then they drain that whey. And here is where the process actually differs depending on which type of Mahon you're making. So Mahon Menorca Artisano is shaped using a cotton cloth uh, traditionally called a fogasse. And then they suspend that and then, and that helps them remove more whey from the cheese. And also that cloth provides the cheese with its signature shape. It has those kind of uneven round edges. Mahon Menorca can actually be shaped using molds according to the PDO guidelines, which it still, which still gives it rounded edges, but they're much more uniform. Mahon Menorca Artisano is then pressed still inside the cloth. It's very important to note that. And because it's pressed inside the cloth, it results in the imprint of the cloth binding on the top of the cheese. And you can see that on the slide there that I have. And that imprint is known as the mamea. I do have a photo of that. And Mahon Menorca, on the other hand, is pressed inside the mold. So it does result in that smooth, clean rind and then the more uniform corners that I mentioned earlier. Pressing a cheese helps to expel any excess whey until the cheese reaches the cheesemaker's desired consistency. So both of these cheeses are pressed and they're pressed for about 10 hours to remove that desired amount of whey from the cheese. And then it's brined. So they brine this cheese for a maximum of 48 hours. And this is a process that's also known as wet salting. So salt, if in case you weren't aware, um, Salt is an incredibly important part of cheese making because it not only does it affect the flavor of the cheese and the final product, but it also does a lot of other things. So it regulates microbial growth. It affects the pH levels of the cheese. It helps with rind formation. Um, it also helps determine the cheese's final texture by you know, helping the, the, the whey get um, expelled. So I'm not gonna go into it farther than that. It's really fascinating and complicated cheese science, um, but if you would like to read more about that, I definitely recommend it. So the last part of the process of cheese making for Mahon Menorca is to place the cheese in the aging caves where it will be consistently turned. And then they actually smear it with olive oil and pimenton, which is Spanish paprika, until it's done aging and it's ready to be eaten. The addition of the oil and the pimentone enhances the appearance of the rind, um, gives it that kind of like signature orange color that you see there. And it also prevents excessive drying of the rind and prevents unwanted molds from growing during aging. Um, affinage, which is cheese aging, is really truly an art as much as it is a science. So the length of time that it spends in the, the aging cave really depends on the desired age profile of the cheesemaker. And there are a few different profiles of Mahon Menorca. Um, and so I have them, I don't know if I have them listed here, but I'll tell you. Um, the youngest one is called Fresco. It's aged for about two weeks. It's gonna be very soft and very mild. The one that we're eating right now is Semi Curado, which is aged for two to four months. And this is the most popular one in the United States. And then the older age profiles are six months and then 18 months, which are Viejo and Añejo. And as the cheeses get older, they do get harder, they get more intense and more nutty and earthy in flavor. But we're gonna focus on the semi-curado right now. So 
as you as you've heard making cheese obviously is an incredibly labor intensive and physically difficult and intense process and sometimes people don't really consider all of the hard work that goes into making a single wheel of cheese and so when I'm managing uh, my team of mongers at the counter, I always tell them to show respect to this cheese. And showing respect to that cheese means keeping, keep, keeping it in good condition, cutting it and wrapping it the correct way. And you're showing respect to everyone involved in the process of getting that cheese to the counter that way. So everyone from the cows to the farmers, to the cheese makers, to the importers and distributors. You're, give, you're making sure that the customer gets the highest quality final product that they possibly can. And so that's a big part of being a cheesemonger. I don't know what, what the audience is like now. I don't know if you guys are all cheesemongers or like distributors or shop owners or what, um, but I, I am a, a cheesemonger first and foremost. So I'm going to focus a lot on, on marketing and I'm sorry, merchandising and, and proper techniques, best practices and things like that. All right, so let's do the fun part now. Is everyone ready to taste? We're good. Everybody has their little cheese. I've got a um, piece of cheese here. This is a really good knife for a semi-soft cheese. Um, so we're going to jump right into the tasting here. You should have received a piece of the Mahone Menorca in the mail, courtesy of the designation, the DO, in collaboration with Culture Magazine and Foods from Spain. So thank you so much to them for sending us this amazing cheese. Um, I do always recommend bringing your cheese to room temperature before you taste or serve it. So having a, a room temperature cheese helps you experience the full depth of flavor and all of the nuance that this cheese has to offer. Basically the rule of thumb is the colder the cheese is, the less flavor you're gonna be able to taste. And you also really get to experience that really dense creamy texture too. So 30 to 45 minutes before you're planning on eating or serving usually does the trick. All right, so we're gonna take a look at it first. Just take a quick look at it. This there's, it has this like straw yellow paste, this really beautiful bright orange rind, and it's a really, really visually pleasing cheese. It's very stunning. Um, you have some little holes in there. The technical term for those is eyes. Um, and these are, these are pretty small. So right, right off the bat, this is a great cheese to have in the case because it is visually stunning, very beautiful, very eye-catching. Um, so now we're gonna talk about texture. So I'm gonna cut a little piece right off of my cheese there. I have a little piece here. I'm just gonna gently press it between your fingers. This is a semi-soft cheese. The texture is fairly elastic. It's fairly supple. It bounces back a little bit if you squeeze it. So in, if, at room temperature, if it's truly room temperature, you could squeeze it and it would have like kind of a dense peanut buttery texture almost when you eat it. Um, as I mentioned, when they press the cheese during cheese making, it does help create that really smooth, dense texture in the final product that we have here. Um, we're almost there. We're almost going to eat it, I promise. Um, so next we're going to smell it. It smells milky. I mean, it is cheese, but this one has like a very definite, um, like fresh milk um, aroma. It smells buttery. It has a little bit of a tangy element. Are you guys getting that? Do you smell anything that I'm not mentioning? No, okay, we're good. And we get to the fun part, we're gonna taste the cheese. So just take a bite of it and then slowly chew and savor that bite. And you really wanna get, you wanna hit all, all parts of your palate in their mouth. So you, you're gonna take it, you're gonna press it against the roof of your tongue for the roof of your mouth with your tongue for a few seconds and just, just let it rest and experience that flavor. See what I mean about that texture? That's a really, really beautiful texture. So this is a really cool cheese. It's pretty mild, but it has a lot of flavor, really big buttery notes, um, slightly like hazelnut, a little bit of pineapple even. It's a very lactic. It's really, really delicious and not overwhelming at all. Very, very easy to snack on and eat an entire piece in one sitting like I did. And then I had to go and get more cheese for this, uh, for this class because I did eat the entire piece all in one afternoon. And I regret nothing, honestly. Amelia, yes. can I interrupt you for one second? It's Susan, we have a question. Um, yes. How much do each of the wheels weigh? I don't know if we've covered that. Um, so there are actually different size wheels. Um, I don't know the exact weight off the top of my head of each of the different sizes. 
Um, but I did learn from the from the organization, the DO, that it does take 10 liters of milk to make one kilo of cheese, um, which is a, a cool fact that just popped into my brain. But maybe Ava has, um, has a, a better answer to that question. We can go back to it too. Oh, there you are, Ava, great, thank yes. you. Yes, sorry. Well, uh, well, the wheel, the well, the wheel or the piece? Do you mean? Do you mean the piece or or the whole? I think they mean the, the wheel. The whole cheese. The, well, a whole cheese. The biggest ones are between uh, two and a half and three kilo, and three kilos, and the small ones between sixty grams. Sorry, sorry, I I don't have the the measures in inch, sorry, That's with okay. grams or kilos, it is okay. The big, the big pieces, it's uh, two point five uh, uh, and three kilos. Great, thank you. Okay, and we have a question also. The rind, I think I know we're going to get to this, right, Amelia? The rind is yes. it meant to be eaten. Oh yes, yeah. so that's actually the very next thing I was going to talk about. Um, so. Great. We did talk about the rind, how the rind is rubbed in that mixture of oil and pimentone. Um, and it, while it gives it that signature flavor, and it is, I'm sorry, the signature color, and it is technically edible, we don't recommend eating the rind on this one. It just isn't really going to taste amazing. It's, you technically could eat it, but we don't recommend it. Any, um, do you have any other questions before we go to the next slide? No, I just, uh, we have a, a comment, beautiful cheese. I think we it agree. It sure is. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree. Yeah, it's, um, it's really mild, but it's not boring. Like it's just a little bit adventurous um, and also really versatile. Like I've, you know, I just snack on it at my desk at work sometimes, but it's also really perfect for catering platters or just, you know, serving before dinner, which um, we will talk about in a little bit. But overall, definitely a really, really amazing cheese. All right, so we can go to the next slide. So we're going to talk a little bit about how to properly cut and wrap and merchandise this cheese to maximize your sales. Um, we do have a mix of more experienced and, and newer mongers, I guess, in the group. Um, so I'm going to use I'm going to use some terms that you may or may not know, and then I will explain them. Um, and for anyone that was on the last webinar that we did, I'm going to kind of go over some of, some of the same concepts, but they are really important to note in terms of best practices. So I'm sorry if you've already heard this, but we're going to do it for everyone who wasn't there for the last time. So. For a cut to order or a display case, you're going to want to do what's called glass wrapping this cheese. If you're just cutting your wheel in half and then you're displaying them in the full serve case, um, you want to glass wrap that. And I do have a photo of what that looks like on the top there. That is my cheese at my counter. Um, and you can't even tell that there's plastic wrap on there, right? And so what that means is you, you're plastic wrapping this cheese so that it has a completely smooth face and a completely, um, completely smooth top rind in the case. And you're pulling all of that excess plastic wrap to the back and underneath the cheese. So it's hidden from the customer's view and it looks like it's not even wrapped. It's just completely smooth. Um, basically, this is so that the customer can get a clear view of what the cheese actually looks like. They can get a clear view of that really beautiful rind. Um, and also it just looks a lot neater in the case. And I also, because I work in a higher volume grocery store, we have a grab and go case. And so sometimes we take wheels in the home and then we cut them to, we cut them into, into pieces and wrap them and put them out in the grab and go case for people to just take. Um, because sometimes we're just really, really busy and people don't have time to stop by the counter and talk to a monger and get cut to order cheese. Um, so having a grab and go case is definitely good if you do a lot of high volume. Um, but sometimes we do put Mahone in the case. And so we'll talk about that. Um, we'll talk about that as well. Um, I do like to use a table wire to cut this particular age of Mahone, but you could definitely use like a chef knife or whatever other large knife that you have behind your counter. Um, but I also kind of determine which tool I'm going to use to cut a cheese based on the texture. So like a younger, softer Mahone, I would definitely use a table wire as well as for a more aged Mahone Menorca. Somewhere in the middle is gonna be your sweet spot for being able to cut that easily with a knife. Um, 
obviously this is just what works for me and it's not the you know the be all end all of like cutting cutting guides so if you if there's something that works for you better that's great I totally support you in that um so in terms of how to cut it i like to cut this wheel in half and then i cut pieces radially off of that half wheel even though it is a square um and i'm sure that you have seen a, have seen a square wheels cut in different ways to get more even slices I like to do it this way, and I'll tell you why, even rind to paste distribution and also less waste. Um, so this is, this is the method that's gonna yield the most even cuts. And so if you're doing it the other way, you're, you're gonna cut it into squares and then you're gonna end up with one piece at the very end that either you have to cut the rind off of to get the, the paste on both sides, which is a waste of rind, or you're gonna have you're gonna have one piece for someone that's gonna buy a piece of cheese that's mostly rind, and both of those situations are not ideal. So this is the way that I like to do it. Um, and then in terms of plastic wrapping, um, we're glass wrapping these as well, and it's gonna be a little bit harder because they are smaller. Um, but you do want to wrap that as tightly and as neatly as possible, and that is for aesthetic reasons. But it also helps to lengthen the shelf life by keeping excess moisture out from between the cheese and the plastic wrap. So you basically just make sure all that plastic wrap is pulled to the back of the piece of cheese and secure it with your price tag or your scale sticker. And I also really like using the repack stickers that come with cheeses, um, the ones that the, the, the makers of the cheese give you. And they, they really are interesting because customers' eyes are drawn to them, especially if they're you know, aesthetically pleasing. And they also are good for providing information on that cheese that maybe you don't have space to include on your scale tab. So there are different producers of Mahone Menorca, as I mentioned um, before, but they do all have that DOP seal on them that guarantees that authenticity. And that specifically is what we want to teach our customers to be on the lookout for. So our job as cheesemongers is to provide cheese, but we also provide education. We love, we, it is our job to educate our consumers and give them the tools that they need to confidently purchase their high quality and authentic products like Mahone Menorca. In terms of the size of your cut pieces, um, you can see it on the slide there. It's really up to you based on your customer's buying patterns and your price point for this cheese. So you have to decide what works best for you. What works best for us is roughly like one third to one half pound pieces. This is a very, very popular and very snackable cheese with a fairly like reasonable price point in terms of artisan cheese. So it's definitely one of our more popular cheeses. Um, so that, that, those two things together make it easier to sell larger pieces, like up to a half pound. Um, but another thing to remember is that a lot of customers are generally more likely to look at the price tag before they consider how much cheese they actually need. Um, so you want to think about the optics of your price tags. I like to keep the numbers between seven and twelve dollars. That's usually like not a very scary number for a customer to see and then they're going to be more likely to just grab it and put it in their basket. Um, in terms of how often to cut the cheese, I always tell people only cut as much cheese as you need at any given time. Obviously outside of the holidays, that's a very busy time and you do wanna have back stock for that. On normal days, only cut as much cheese as you need. It ensures that your customers are always getting products that's as fresh as possible and therefore as flavorful as possible. So you always wanna think about what you can do to give your customers the best experience because if you give them that good experience, they'll come back and they'll buy more cheese over and over and over again. So every piece of cheese that you cut and sell in your shop is an opportunity for you to make that good impression and create repeat business. And that's good for your shop, it's good for your department, and it's really good for the producers as well. So if there's one thing that you take from this, I hope that it's that. <laughs> um, all right, so we can go to the next slide. Does anybody have any questions? Nope, we're good? Okay. Um, sampling. It's been a little hard to talk to, to do it with COVID happening, um, but in my shop, we are back to doing um, what we call active sampling. And it is something that can make or break a sale. Um, so I try to offer a sample to every customer that comes into my shop, even you know if they're not directly looking for cut to order help, if they're at the grab and go, I say, hey, do you wanna try a sample of this cheese that I have out? 
usually they say yes. And that, that starts that conversation and you can have that interaction with them that probably will lead to them buying some cheese. So when you cut a sample for a customer, there are a couple of guidelines that I like to follow. The first one is that you always face the cheese. And that means you scrape or cut a thin layer of the face of the cheese of that paste so that the customer is tasting the cheese itself and not any residual plastic wrap or fridge flavor that it might have gotten if it's been you know, sitting in the plastic wrap for a few days. You should also always cut, if the customer orders a piece of cheese, always cut that piece of cheese from the side that you sampled from. And that ensures that the piece you sell to the customer tastes like the sample they got and it's, um, they're getting the flavor they expect from the cheese, essentially. There's no surprises when they get it home. The most important thing in this slide is please never sample off the tip of a knife. I know it looks really cool. We've all done it one or two times. Don't do it. It's just dangerous. It's not worth it. So I always like to have little small pieces of like cheese paper or deli paper ready at the side of the counter to just kind of grab one, put the sample on, and then hand it to the customer. It's just safer and more sanitary. Um, so those are just some things I always like to talk about when talking about sampling. Some of them people know, some of them don't. So I'd like to give you the whole, the whole spiel. All right. We will now talk about how to pair this cheese. And this is a really big question that we get at the cheese counter all the time. It's probably the most asked question is what do you pair with this cheese? And it's such a broad question too. There's just so many ways, so many directions that you can go with this. So it does maybe get overwhelming for mongers who are less experienced and um, don't have as much experience doing cheese pairings. So we're gonna talk about ways to make that a little bit less daunting. One of my favorite pairing suggestions is to remember the phrase, what grows together goes together. And so this means that cheese from a certain region or country will likely pair well with other products from that region or country. And we're talking things like wine, beer, charcuterie, jams, olives, fruit, that kind of thing. Pretty much anything, you name it, um, it can be a cheese pairing. And you also want to consider pairings that are going to either contrast or complement the flavors of your cheese. So you never want your flavors to be fighting against each other. You really want them to like work together in harmony. And so, what that means is a, con a contrasting pairing are two very different flavors. So something like a blue cheese and a honey, those are very, very different flavors, but they work together well because the sweetness of the honey neutralizes a the, the spiciness of the blue cheese and makes it a little more palatable. And then you have complementary pairings where the flavors of the pairing and the cheese are similar and they work together in harmony, like the sweetness of, of Gouda with something like a bourbon with those vanilla notes. So. Um, when, we, when we go into these pairings that I've suggested, just keep those kind of guidelines in mind. Um, my dog is obviously very excited to hear about these pairings as she's yelling from the other room. So here are some of my suggested pairings for Mahone Menorca. And I had a really fun time doing these because I basically just got to eat a bunch of cheese with a bunch of different things and see what worked best. So. Um, that's my favorite, one of my favorite parts of being a cheesemonger is um, professional snacking, which is, we can't really complain about that. So for wine, um, and I, oh, I forgot to mention, I worked with the, the wine department, the wine manager and buyer, and also our beer buyer at the Green Grape to get these pairings for you. So I talked to two very smart, very um, uh, experienced people to get these pairings. So for wine. We recommend any kind of light to medium bodied Spanish red wine. Um, so our wine buyer suggested Mencia, Rioja, Garnacha, Verdejo, Vira, or even Cava. This cheese has such a buttery texture that something bubbly like a Cava is really going to cut through that texture and lift it. And it really was very cool. So I definitely recommend that. Um, there's a lot of fresh and herbal flavors in those pairings, and they're very, very refreshing with the slight fruitiness of Mahon Menorca. And in my research, what I also found was that um, people recommend spirits like a glass of sherry or even some sake have, were really good with this cheese. So definitely recommend um, trying that. For beer, um, our beer buyer suggested uh, two beers um, from Europe, Mahu or Estrella Galicia. 
And those are both lagers. So they're like very light flavors, you know, kind of floral almost. Um, and they were good because they did not overwhelm the flavor of the cheese, which sometimes beer tends to do. Those were definitely, um, those were very good pairings. If, you know, just the weather's been nicer. If you're hanging out outside with some friends, having a little picnic, grab some Mahon Menorca, get a couple of beers in the park, great option. Um, my personal favorite is always cider. I'm definitely a cider person. So Chloe, please, Chloe. Um, I'm definitely a cider person. So I really love like a Basque Cedra. It has those funky notes that really play well with this cheese. So uh, moving on to nuts and fruits, um, obviously classic iconic cheese pairing is Marcona almonds. And I really liked a more flavorful Mar Marcona almond with rosemary specifically. Um, those are again, really just classic cheese pairings. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. Um, Outside of Marcona almonds, I also really liked any dried fruit. They had a lot of sweetness to them, especially these dried Spanish pajarero figs that we have that we sell in bulk at the shop. They're very chewy and very sweet and then a little bit crystallized on the outside. So it gave it a little bit of a crunch and the texture of that together with the texture of the cheese was really amazing. Um, last couple of things, I really liked Valencia orange jam or orange marmalade with this cheese. It had a slight bitterness that played really well with the sweetness of the cheese. So that's, I'm, I'm reading your comments as they're coming in. So um, I'm glad our, I'm glad all of our dogs are very excited to uh, eat, potentially eat some cheese later. Um, right. So the, the Valencia orange jam, really great. And then um, crackers, I, I tried some traditional Spanish picos with some breadsticks. Um, you really want to pick something that's not going to overwhelm or overpower the flavor of this cheese, especially since it's on the milder side. Um, so uh, yeah, you want to complement these flavors. You don't want to drown them out. And then those, those picos and breadsticks are definitely the perfect vehicle for that. So I know this is a lot of information. It can seem overwhelming when we're talking about pairings, but it really is important to remember not to stress out when you're choosing pairings. Um, there are guidelines, um, but there are no hard rules and it's really all about what tastes good to you. And that's the important thing to remember. So have you, did you guys have any pairings with you for the tasting today? Are there any that you tried that I didn't mention that you thought were really, really amazing that everyone should know about? You got no. Amelia, do you see the question? Um, or you see, oh, you, there's some comments and questions in the chat. Yes, I am yep. seeing them right now. Um, uh, Gruner Veltliner, I love that wine. That's one of my favorite wines. Um, Induya, definitely a good option as well. Um, there's also a Underground Meats makes a um, something very similar called Sobrasada, which is like a Spanish version of Induya, which is awesome. Love that. Orange Jam Marcona Almonds, awesome. Pears, totally. Great with cava pecans. Yeah. So obviously you guys have a lot of really, really good suggestions for this. And I'm really glad that you are enjoying them. All right. So I have a question for everybody. Um, who's, who already carries this cheese? If you're a cheese shop or cheesemonger, who already is uh, carrying this cheese in your shop? see. Oh, Renee says, I carry this one and the aged one. Great. Thank you. Uh, Venissimo cheese in San Diego. Thank you, Rachel. Great. Not to put you on the spot. I was just curious. <laughs> oh, we have a raised hand. Uh, Kevin. You can talk. But you're muted. Hey, we just to answer your question. Yes, we have in the shop. Awesome. Thanks, Kevin. 
Thanks, Susan. Oh, rising tide market in Maine. Thank you, Debbie. One of my favorite local spots to shop for great cheese. And Liam says, I carry this one in the Reserva at Liberty Heights Fresh in Salt Lake. Uh, at Cust Cust Custa, is that how I'm pronouncing it? Lynn Affleck, um, I've carried aged in a reserve one as well. And also Jeanette, Mananak Food Co-op in Keene, New Hampshire. Sandy has this one at New Seasons. Um, some people used to carry it, but don't currently. Oh, Victoria says we carry the reserve at Babylon Cheese Cellar. Awesome, thanks guys. All right, so um, the one last thing that I wanted to talk about before we go into the question, the, um, the last 10 minutes where we answer some questions is how to serve this cheese. So as I mentioned before, Mahon Menorca is a very versatile cheese. You can use it for just about anything, but I wanted to um, provide some specific examples, just some inspiration for you. So as I mentioned before, you should remove your cheese 30 to 45 minutes before serving it um, because that gives, you, that gives you the full flavor of this cheese. And so when you include Mahon Menorca on a catering platter, for example, or if you're just you know, serving cheese to a party that you're having or some friends, I really recommend leaving the rind on as we have learned it's visually stunning, it's very pleasing. Um, so it's gonna be very visually appealing on any platter. I also like to tell people not to cut the slices too thin. Um, basically because when you cut a thicker slice and you bite into it, you get to experience that texture, that very dense kind of like creamy texture a lot more easily. And that again is one of the most important experiences of eating this cheese. Um, it's uh, definitely, um, definitely a crowd pleaser. It works on any type of platter with really any pairings as we have uh, discovered today. Um, in terms of the suggested serving sizes, we at the shop normally recommend one ounce per person per cheese. But if you're serving other foods, if there's a lot of other things available at um, in whatever spread that you're serving, you're going to want to adjust that to make sure that you're not you're not going to have end up with any waste at the end. Or alternatively, um, have to go boxes or uh, little bags for people to take cheese home with them, which is never a bad idea. Who doesn't love to take cheese home? Um, okay. When you're building, I'm so sorry, this is very upsetting. I'm very embarrassed. Um, um, Amelia? When you're cutting your, yes. Do you want to go take a minute and see if you can quiet her? Yeah, and I'm so we will sorry. chat among ourselves. No, I know it's it's you didn't expect this and this hasn't happened before. So yeah, um, I put her in yeah. the other room and I think she's just upset that she's not out here eating cheese. Um, <laughs> give me like give me one second. I am so sorry. That's okay. That's all right. Everybody gets it. It's totally fine. Who has a dog? I have a dog, but she's not. She's downstairs. Um, thanks, Rachel. Yes, dogs are great. And I'm sure Amelia will be able to get Chloe calm down. Um, oh, thanks, Michelle. All right, everything's fine. She, she really just wanted to come out here and eat cheese. That's it. <laughs> there you go. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, I, dog. Um, I don't blame her. So, okay, getting back. Getting back to what I was saying about serving Mahone Menorca, um, when you're building your platters, you do want to make sure that everything on your platter, including the cheeses, are in bite-sized pieces that are easy for guests to pick up. It's really important to make your platters very accessible for snacking and just for you know grabbing and going. Um, you don't really want to task your guests with taking a knife and trying to cut off large pieces of trying to cut off pieces of cheese from a, a larger chunk. It, just, it For some reason, it's very intimidating to them. It's it's a strange intimidating thing, but I have seen it happen in a lot of different events. So I always recommend cutting it into kind of smaller pieces. And I think in the little booklet that came with your cheese, um, there is a cutting diagram for that, which was very helpful. Um, I, did, I did really enjoy reading that booklet. 
And speaking of the booklet, there were some really awesome recipes in there. And that really, it showcases the versatility of the cheese um, across really every aspect of, of food. They have, there were some pastry recipes, there were desserts, there were appetizers. I really liked the eggplant recipe, that, that the baked eggplant looked really, really cool. So definitely one of my favorite things in, in that book, but you can use it for salads, you can put it on sandwiches, it melts really well. So you could do grilled cheeses, mac and cheese. Um, it was specifically mentioned to me that this is really good on pizza. And then also the older varieties are great for grating. So over pasta, risotto, salads, anything like that. So really, again, a very versatile and useful cheese for really anything that you need a cheese for. Um, great. So if, uh, if anyone has any questions, now is going to be the time to ask them. Um, thank you so all so much for listening to me and to Chloe, especially. <laughs> um, and I hope that you guys learned something new about Mahone Menorca and that you can take that to your staff and to your customers and really show, um, show your, your, your customer bases how amazing this cheese really is. So we do have a few minutes to answer some questions. So if you have any, let's, uh, let's talk about them. And they can be questions for Amelia as well as for Ava or for um, Jeffrey. So let's see. Okay. Anybody else has an, has uh, have any pairing suggestions? Everyone's being very quiet because you're all eating your cheese, right? So. <laughs> uh. Well, I would just add some type of wholesome bread with nuts and raisins or cranberries, any of these buttery cheeses, just toast it a little bit, the bread, and it's a fantastic, simple, very enjoyable pairing. Yes, I really want to melt this cheese on something. It seems like it would be great to melt. Good. Oh, somebody says uh, fig spread, tart cherry spread. I have a garlic pizza recipe that Mahan would be lovely with. Absolutely. Oh, question from Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Can we visit the creamery if we find ourselves in town? Ava, if Sarah happens to find herself on Menorca, can she go to the creamery? Sarah and I were just in Italy together. So everyone is, is very welcome to Menorca. So just, just contact uh, the council and uh, for us, it will be a pleasure to, to show any farm or, or any, any company she wants. For Great. sure. Great. Let's plan a trip, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> so. Okay. Oh, it's great in Bougere, which I, yeah. Ooh, that sounds really good. That sounds really, really wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. Because it would melt nicely into the, into the Bougere mixture. So. I was very fascinated by all of the like baking and pastry recipes that were in that little book. Because, you know, I never really think about some cheeses that way. Um, so it made me really want to try it. Oh, I know. There's a recipe for something with chocolate, right? Yeah. In here. Yeah, it's incredible. Very, very clever recipes. Yeah, whoever, whoever came up with those did a very good job. Absolutely. And I really want to try the one, um, the Mahon Menorca cheese and mushroom risotto. Oh, here it is, the cheese semi, Mahon Menorca cheese semi fritter with chocolate and red wine sauce. Oh my goodness, that sounds amazing. Well, if, if nobody has, <laughs> oh, somebody yeah. says, oh, be still my heart on the Gougere. Yeah, um, they sound great. If nobody has anything else um, on behalf of Culture Magazine and, and Culture Media, I'm going to say thank you so much to Amelia, to Eva, and to Jeffrey for all of your contributions today. It's been a really, really fascinating um, webinar. And I hope um, all of you have been attending uh, agree. And we always love seeing you on these virtual seminars. We are going to be returning 
to in-person countercultures sometime in the fall. So stay tuned for that. Um, and I will uh, now turn it over to our panelists to say their goodbyes as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I just, have a so I just went to party vote for everybody. Share some home with people, help them discover this great cheese. <laughs> Definitely. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for being on the on the call and I hope you learned something. And if you do have any questions, if you come up with any more questions after the presentation, I think on the last slide there was an email address to send them to. Is there any way we can pull that up again? Sure we can. There we go. Just in Great. case anybody Perfect. missed it previously. Great. Awesome. All yeah, right. and that that is that is it. Thank you again. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you Thank soon. You. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye Have a good now. night, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.